Welcome to PSI's webinar, Self-Injury, Critical Issues. Hello, I'm Karen McKelvey, PSI's Director of Professional Development. And on behalf of all of us at PSI, we are pleased to host Dr. Colleen Lorber and Dr. Scott Poland today. The health and safety of our students is continually on the minds of educators, parents, and students. PSI partners with hundreds of schools via our school psychology staff, intervention specialists, special education staff, gifted ESL and remedial teachers, and a wide variety of school health staff. Along with all of you, PSI staff considers of paramount importance the safety of the students with which we work. PSI is pleased to have among its resources such expert partners as Dr. Scott Poland to train not only PSI staff, but also to provide professional development to our partner schools. As a national expert on this topic, Dr. Poland will be providing the clinical overview of this topic. Afterwards, Dr. Lorber will be providing information on how PSI staff deals with these issues in its partner schools. Dr. Lorber is the director of PSI's Department of Educational Support Services. Her department includes psych psychologists, speech therapists, PTs, OTs, English as a second language and foreign language teachers, and intervention specialists. Dr. Lorber holds a doctorate in school psychology from Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. Her dedication to staff, professionalism, and her high energy level serves the students and staff in our partner schools. Dr. Scott Poland is a premier expert on school safety and violence prevention and a PSI expert partner. He personally responded in the aftermath of 13 school shootings and has authored several books and articles on school safety, youth violence, bullying, and suicide. A frequent guest on major network news programs, Dr. Poland is currently on the faculty of Nova Southeastern University and the coordinator of their suicide and violence prevention office. Before I turn the program over to Scott and Colleen, I want to say we will be recording this session and it will be archived for further usage by our registrants. If time allows, you can submit questions that will be answered at the end. Please utilize the control panel on the right of your screen there, much like an instant message. Upon completion of the webinar and submission of the evaluation that will um, be available, you will receive a certificate of completion via email. We will also post the recording of the webinar on the PSI website within a week or so. And now, PSI is pleased to present Scott Poland. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you all for listening today. And we're going to be talking about a really challenging behavior. To be honest with you, I did work in the schools for 26 years, and this behavior has caught a lot of schools by surprise. Traveling all around the country, I asked school personnel, do you have any kind of guideline or anything in the policy uh, procedure? Basically, do you have a plan about how to deal with students engaging in self-injury? And for the most part, schools do not. And this is something that PSI would be excellent in helping schools to develop such a plan. But let's begin with this example. Julie was at a middle school sleepover. She was dared to burn herself. And it was like a rite of passage. Oh, we're all doing this. Show your special affinity to our friendship, and you need to do it too. But when she did burn her arm, she smelled a small rush and a sense of power. Several months later, there was a big argument and a difficult time for Julie. She knew what she was going to do as she went looking for a candle and was going to burn herself for relief. And this is a behavior that's very difficult for most adults to understand. Typically, we are quite horrified. We demand that they stop, but we really need to get to the underlying issues. We have to realize this is a complex behavior. It fulfills a multitude of needs, and there's debate. Is it addictive? 
or is it just a maladaptive way to regulate emotions? And one of the messages today is we all have to keep up and be looking for the latest research about this behavior and the most effective treatments. And some of the school reactions, I already mentioned being horrified, demanding that they stop and being shocked, but we might be really ill-prepared for the volume of this behavior. And I know that some researchers said that as high as 92% of all school counselors have been working with kids that have engaged in this behavior. So we've got to refrain from that horrifying first reaction. We've got to be compassionate, caring, curious, not too curious, but just try to really get at the underlying behaviors. And is self-injury, and please know that it's gone by a multitude of terms, self-harm, self-mutilation, self-injury. The most common and accepted term today is non-suicidal self-injury, meaning that their intent is not to die by suicide. It is a superficial or moderate wound. Now, one of my great interests is suicide prevention, and part of my interest in self-injury is trying to understand what is the relationship between these two behaviors. Because some people will say, oh, it's two types of kids. This group over here is suicidal. This group is engaging in self-injury, most commonly cutting. But it is a continuum, and research is really even referring to self-injury as a gateway, as a way that kids acquire a capability to make a suicide attempt. Often adults think only, only this behavior is attention seeking. And I will acknowledge sometimes it can be. You got a kid in an elementary school who takes a paper, paper clip and they're digging like holes in the palm of their hand and it's starting to bleed. Okay, this is not a good behavior. This is manipulative and attention seeking. But most of what we're talking about today is a behavior that really is kept pretty hidden. And kids are very adept at hiding this behavior, especially from the adults in their lives. Sometimes they are ashamed of the behavior. And as we get into the prevalence in a few minutes, I suspect everybody's gonna be a little surprised at how often or what percentage of kids engage in this behavior. And even those of us with degrees in nursing, counseling, psychology, social work can often feel pretty unprepared. A colleague of mine one time said, oh, have every kid in the school like raise their hands up high. And obviously we're not gonna do that, but what he's really trying to get across is if the kid raises their hands high in the air, we're gonna get to see their forearms. And really the most common parts of the body are the forearms, the stomach, and the thighs. And a number of kids have talked about wearing their long sleeve t-shirts all year round, whether it's hot or not. Or a girl will have like 30 or 40 bracelets on their arm. They're pretty good at hiding this behavior. And talking to kids when somebody is suspected cutting and they have the mark on their arm, and you ask, well, how did that get there? What is happening? It's not unusual for them to say, oh, my cat scratched me. And rather than confronting that immediately, I might ask, well, how often does that happen? And what's that feel like? And is there a way that we can reduce the number of times that your cat scratches you? Uh, another great quote is that my body expresses what my words cannot. And everybody listening would wish simply that kids would talk about whatever it is. They would write about whatever it is as opposed to engaging in cutting behavior. So there's the most recent data I can find about age of onset. With the 12 to 15 year olds, we basically, that's when the behavior is the most common. But have you ever heard somebody say, self-injury begins and ends in adolescence? Well, I wish I could say that it ends in adolescence, but unfortunately, 
There are many adults that still struggle with this behavior. And we also have some upper elementary school students engaging in the behavior. So there's the estimate between 15 and 20 percent of middle and high school students have at one time or another engaged in self-injury. And a good question is, where do they learn about it? Well, they learn about it from television programs, from movies like 13. They learn about it on the internet. They learn about it from their friends. There are some internet sites that have a warning like, don't enter. You're going to find out about cutting, and you're going to do it, and you're going to love it, which is an indication of the potential power of the behavior. So we might estimate in the middle school and high school population, 6 to 7 percent are currently engaging in the behavior. So I want to look at a couple of examples. So you're a teacher, and you've noticed a student has a bandage on their forearms. And as you think about it, you're like, wow, I'm not sure I've ever seen this student with short sleeves. What should you do? And as you're all thinking about that, well, we might think of a veteran confident teacher with good rapport who could simply sit down with Julie and talk to her. But obviously, it would need to be in private. But if a teacher's not confident in making an inquiry, then the school nurse, school counselor, the school psychologist would be a great person to talk with Julie, and the teacher should basically alert them to what they are suspecting with regards to Julie's behavior. So I talked earlier about this multitude of terms, and sometimes people ask me about what about tattoos and what about you know body piercings. Well, those typically are not done under stress, and those are not done in order to feel better. I mean, there's a multitude of reasons why tattoos and piercings are done, and they're certainly becoming much more culturally sanctioned. But we're really talking about, with self-injury, something that is done after a precipitating event. And what's that concept mean? Precipitating event, most commonly, is a severe argument with parents, severe argument with the peer, some kind of humiliation, dis misfortune, maybe victimization uh, from bullying, and the student is actually engaging in the self-injury in an attempt to feel better. And there are, in an, at least in psychiatric populations, there's what is called the major type of self-injury. That would be someone that might actually cut off a body part. And then there's the stereotypic self-injury, usually somebody with a developmental disability engaging in chronic head biting or wrist banging. But what we're talking about in this webinar is moderate, superficial. We're talking about a non-hospitalized population. I'll put it in quotes in terms of normal kids, usually actually of normal intelligence. They just break down under stress. So the most common term today is non-suicidal self-injury. All right. Now, as we start looking at a definition, we're talking about this recurrent failure to resist the impulse to harm one's body physically, but most often without suicidal intent. There was the new Axis One proposed in the DSM-5 of repetitive self-injury, repetitive self-mutilization, but that was not a part of the DSM-5. Most commonly, self-injury is listed as one of the behaviors under borderline personality. And the associated diagnoses with self-injury, borderline personality, as I mentioned, mood and anxiety disorders, impulse control disorders, and at least some of the young people that I've worked with have said something like this. It really ticks me off when everybody assumes because I engage in cutting that I have a borderline personality. One of the ways I've learned a lot about self-injury is at the university, it's not unusual for a student to come in, close the door, and talk about the behavior. And of course, I'm always going to ask them, well, what works? What doesn't work? And I know on one occasion, a young woman 
rolled up her left arm sleeve and showed me over 700 scars and said, I only cut on my left arm. And I asked her, well, how do you gain control of this behavior? What helps you? She says, oh, if I could trust myself with the razor blade, I would get cardboard and I would rip it to shreds. But if I can't trust myself with the razor blade, then I'm going to get something like cardboard or a phone book and I'm going to rip it up with my hands. That's an example of what's called a substitute behavior. And it's really important that school personnel have knowledge of many different substitute behaviors. So here we go with complex. We talked about that. Can run in peer groups. Not unusual in a school for maybe a, an assistant principal to call and say, I've got six kids in my office. They're all engaging in cutting. Get your PSI psychologist over here right away. Well, if we were to really look carefully at that situation, I would expect that we might have one dominant person out of the six middle school girls that are in the office. And a good idea might be to separate the alpha female from the others, which raises the question of how effective is group counseling? with kids engaging in cutting behavior. And by the way, cutting is the most common, followed by burning, pinching, scratching, and not letting wounds heal. So how effective is group counseling? Well, most people caution that if the kids are already engaging in self-injury, work with them individually. It would take a very strong group leader to avoid situations where the kids are basically reinforcing each other and talking about how much the self-injury works for them. And there you see the most recent estimate about the relationship between suicide and self-injury. The new term being used is that self-injury can be a gateway to suicide. We'll talk a little bit about that more in just a moment. It can be a right of togetherness. There can be pressure from peers to engage in this behavior and individual counseling preferred over group counseling. So what should schools do? I talked a little bit about what to look for. Warn and involve parents. Yet if we do a literature search today, we are probably going to find some of the literature a little vague about whether it is necessary to call parents if the kid is engaging in self-injurious behavior. Having traveled all around the country, being pretty familiar with the ratio of counselors to students, the ratio of psychologists to students, which is even higher in terms of maybe as many as two or 3,000 or even 4,000 students to one school psychologist, I think we need to be careful not to accept too much responsibility. Very few school mental health professionals can promise 9 o'clock every Tuesday morning, I am there for you. So we'll talk in a few minutes about clarifying what that role might be, and I'll talk about at least one legal case I was involved in that uh, questioned whether or not the parents were notified about the self-injurious behavior of their daughter. Nurse is a key partner here because of the medical needs when somebody's engaged in self-injury. And often there are other problems, not just self-injury. It could be a mood disorder. I was just reading about research emphasizing that students that have attention deficit disorder are more at risk for self-injury. Students that are the victim of bullying are more at risk for self-injury. And in particular, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and questioning youth face a lot of unique challenges in schools and in families and communities. And those challenges also put them at risk to engage in this behavior. So in particular with the LGBTQ youth, there may be a lack of family support. There may be a lack of school support. There may be problematic relationships and rejection from peers. There may not be strong 
engagement and connections with the community at large and these unique challenges can put them at risk not only for suicide because we know their suicide rates and attempts are two to or three times that of their heterosexual peers but it also puts them at risk for self-injury as well schools need to partner and link with the community one of the things that is uh, we're going over this today is to be thinking about well who would I refer a kid to that is engaging in self-injury who in the community in the way of private practitioners who in the community at the mental health center who actually has skill and expertise because telling these kids to stop is not going to help do teach the substitute behaviors do hopefully help them to learn to communicate through other means and not letting their body express their emotions how can they relearn to release tension tension and isolation so this slide and we could spend a very long time on it but let's just highlight a few of the things that are different when somebody is suicidal at least at this moment they're trying to end unendurable pain or the person engaging in self-injury is actually trying to feel better precipitating event that is common with both suicide attempts and self-injurious behavior those that self-injure often use multiple methods as opposed to one method for suicide the person that is suicidal often has given a lot of warnings the young person engaged in self-injury is probably not giving warnings and of course the self-injury is very repetitive can become addictive and assessing for suicide risk is very important in both situations you have a young person engaging in self-injury I assure you that if you ask them about thoughts to end their life you are not going to plant the idea of suicide in their head they're already aware this is an option they have they're already aware of classmates who've talked about it or made attempts safety contract this is a concept that is very useful in both situations what you're really trying to do is help the young person develop a strategy that gives them options thanks to substitute what can you do when you have this incredible urge to cut and really what we're trying to do is get them through maybe five difficult moments the kids at home they're in the bathroom they have the urge to cut can we get them to leave the bathroom go in the kitchen where mom is making dinner go sit with their younger brother who's watching a television program take them out of that particular situation and to be honest with you I believe that parent notification is the essential in both situations the only exception you believe the kid is being abused now you're calling protective services but you might be thinking well it's going to destroy the rapport they're not going to talk to me anymore about this behavior but it's really important that we not take on more responsibility than we can actually provide in the way of care for the most part the treatment these young people need is beyond that of the scope of most mental health professionals in schools best scenario we get a supportive reaction from the parents the parent comes to a conference the school staff member is in the room and the kid tells their parent what's going on and the parents respond in a very supportive manner in fact help them figure out and look for the things that trigger their self injurious behavior so what do we know about self injury well you've all heard more females and males okay that is true but the differences aren't quite as great as you might think there's a lot of diversity among the kids that self injure but what seems to be the most common characteristic that they all share is some kind of traumatic event or loss so the similarities are in the trauma that they have experienced so how does the safety contract work that I mentioned earlier well we want 
to help the student take control over the impulses. We want to increase connections with adults. And a very important thing to ask a kid in a counseling office is this simple. Um, who are the adults that you trust at school? Who can you go to for help? And have to make a list. And obviously, we're going to be very concerned if there are very few adults in their life at school or at home or in the community that they trust and feel like they have a good relationship with. Those substitute behaviors are alternatives. So I mentioned a couple, but here would be a few more. Carrying something with them that smells good, that strong aroma. Um, some kids have been successful using those really hot candies. I think they're called a fireball. That gives you really strong sensory input. Scratching their clothes. Uh, drawing on paper with a red magic marker. Uh, red magic marker on your arm. One young person said, I put the red nail polish on my arm. I let it dry, and then I flick it off. Another kid said, long, hot showers. But they work the best when I go into the shower with the ketchup bottle. The sight of something red often seems central to this particular experience. So there's a long list. Many of these are physical, like standing on tiptoes, holding your arms out wide and trying to hold a book, um, relaxation and, and breathing exercises can also be very helpful. The best scenario is for the school to have an entire list. These are some of the things that have helped distract kids before from the urge to cut. Let's go over this list and let's see that what might work for you. Most of the time we think of self-injury involving adolescent girls. Uh, to be honest, uh, the research is really saying more Caucasian girls than girls from other races. They often present as likable, intelligent, functional. Under high stress, they can't think. They feel powerless and angry. What can they take control of? That would be the cutting behavior. And I met two remarkable young women uh, a number of years ago. These young women, Lori and Emily, received a national award for their willingness to talk about their struggle with self-injury. And I brought them to several locations, and we've done presentations before. But perhaps most significant and available to everyone listening, the three of us made a program for the state of Florida. And I was told it's the most watched mental health video in Florida state history. It's not because I'm on it. It's because I just asked the questions. And these girls talk very eloquently about what worked, what didn't work, uh, their counselor. Um, they actually had the same counselor in Oklahoma, and they liked her. And they said the counselor always made time for them. No matter what she was doing, she dropped everything. She didn't mince words. She's asked, are you still cutting? I need to know, are you thinking of suicide also? She would walk around the school with them. They developed quite a great relationship with her. But to be honest, one thing that the counselor failed to do was she never told their parents. And how did the parents find out? Well, with one of them, it was after she made a suicide attempt. Now she's in the hospital, and a therapist gets to the bottom of everything that's going on. With the other one, she talks about she admitted the behavior to her youth minister. The youth minister told her parents, but she denied it. She was so convincing, her parents believed her. Although I couldn't help but think, what would have been a really simple test? Well, roll up your sleeves. Let's see if you have any scars on your arms. And I think parents can be really high in denial of this behavior. And I've often wondered, how could they not notice all the bandages that the family's going through? How could they not see bloody tissue in the wastebasket? How could they not notice the marks on their son or daughter's arms that have been there for months and months? All right, moving on. Here's the good news. It's believed there's a new breed of self-injurer. There's a guy by the name Barrett Walsh who has written brilliantly about uh, self-injury, and he's basically saying they don't hate their body. 
as much as previous generations of self-injurers did. The onset somewhere around 11 or 12, two to one females to male. Good news, they don't usually have an extreme psychiatric history and they are much more receptive to treatment. What's it do? Well, here are the three main theories. Biologically, it releases endorphins. Of course, don't we wish that all these adolescents were going to walk around the track today, swim some laps, chase a ball, get on some kind of machine and exercise? But unfortunately, it's a small number that are engaging in those behaviors. So the self-injury actually releases the exact same endorphin. Now, helping regulate emotions, shutting out the argument my parents are having in the other room. I can concentrate on the blood running down my arm instead. One young lady said, every time my boyfriend called me a slut, that's when I had the incredible urge to cut. And she actually talked about how Scratching clothing was very helpful for her, or pulling something out of her purse that provided a really strong, pleasant odor. And then a, a Freudian viewpoint would be some kind of catharsis, an anger directed inward. The dilemma that a school counselor might face. A girl has been referred to you. She admits she cut last night, following a severe argument at home with her parents. She shows you the injury, and she's begging with you, don't tell my parents. Well, I think I've already answered that, at least in my opinion. We must tell parents. We must help, must help the young lady understand why that is so important. We must help parents understand how they can help their child reduce this behavior, demanding they stop or be horrified is not going to help. We need to be looking for the best treatment possible in our community. All right, now we've got another scenario. This time, the student admits to cutting in the past. They show you their arm. They have the scars, but all of the cuts are healed. Do you call the parents this time? For those of you that are thinking, no, I would just monitor. It looks like they have the behavior under control. I might ask, how do you know she doesn't have a fresh cut on her stomach or a thigh that you can't see? So I'm going to be, for matter of fact, conference with parents, careful monitoring, and the family knowing at least what has been happening to be alert to make sure that it doesn't keep happening. So. Confidentiality suggestions, obviously we need to practice within the limits of our training, but perhaps most importantly, always seek supervision from colleagues and from supervisors, and PSI can certainly provide supervision and clarification, know the ethics and relevant laws in our particular state, and we need to keep records of our interactions with young people engaging in self-injury. And I strongly recommend that personnel that work in support positions have their own liability coverage. And I've already stressed the importance of developing local guidelines and procedures to deal with NSSI. That leads us to a case from New Jersey. I testified in that particular case. What was it all about? Eighth grade girl, was believed to be a cutter. Her friends go in and tell the counselor, let's call her Mary. Mary won't admit it, but she's got the marks on her arms. She hangs out with another student who makes no secret of her cutting behavior, so the counselor calls her in. Counselor's deposition said, I asked Mary about the cuts on her arm. She said, oh, I have an all-terrain vehicle. I ride it through the woods. That's how this happens. So counselor said, I called mom. I said, mom, your daughter has denied this, but you do have a private counselor. I think you should raise this question with the private counselor. 
and self-injury is certainly a problem here at our school. So the parents' deposition was totally different. I was at the school all the time. I never got that call. I only found out about the self-injury nine months later after my daughter's suicide attempt, and now she's in the hospital, and her friends come forward and say, hey, we told the counselor last January. Now, a couple of quick thoughts. I do believe the call actually was made, but I'm going to argue would have been best in a face-to-face -face conversation. There should have been a note of the phone call. The counselor could have walked out of the office, gone to her coworker, and said, you know, just want to let you know, I called Mrs. Coulter, and frankly, I thought it was inexcusable. You see a kid in January suspected of cutting, and you don't see them again, and school's not out till nearly the end of June in New Jersey, and the counselor should have pushed for a release of information to talk to the private practitioner themselves. And of course, the mom needed to pay a whole lot more attention. Mom, didn't you see the marks on her arms? Oh yeah, I saw them for nine months. She told me it was from riding the ATV. Mom, if you can get to the bottom of this in nine months, how can you expect the counselor to figure it out in one conference? Kids will sometimes say, the counselor expects me to tell her my deepest, darkest secret the first 15 minutes we are together. What do kids say? As you glance at those slides, they pretty much all fit into biological, regulating emotions, or a way to punish myself. And sometimes they'll say, I cut so that I will not kill myself. The cutting keeps the trauma from intruding. It's something I can control. It reduces the numbness. And by the way, there are a lot of famous celebrities that have admitted their history of cutting, and some of them even talked about how cutting got them through a difficult adolescence. It really doesn't help to have famous celebrities basically say, hey, it worked for me. So we need to all figure out ways to come up with alternate behaviors. For everybody who's, again, thinking, oh, we just tell them to stop, let's look at this poem. Turn up the music and set the mood once is never enough. Quivering with anticipation. Watch it, the drop spills over and runs down my arm. Crimson orgasm, you seduce me every time, Mr. Nice. Does that give you an idea about how powerful this behavior can be for some of these young people? And then we have to care about the person and look at the underlying issues. Respect their efforts to cope. Help them diminish the behavior. How can we reduce it so it only happens twice this week, not three times? By the way, it's episodic. It does occur under stress. Um, let them know that it can be understood. It can be overcome. But it may take some months or in some cases, even years, to totally control this behavior. I know the two young women that I spoke about, they refer to their cutting instruments. They were my friends. For one of them, it was the box cutter. For the other one, it was the serrated knife. And although they're young adults today, they still have those instruments. And I guess they're demonstrating that I have control I'm not going to get out that cutting instrument again. So those are a couple of the points that have pretty well been made, other than you might wonder, what is a trigger log? The idea is the student writes down, this happened at 2.40 on Tuesday afternoon when I was treated this way by my peer, that's when I had the urge to cut. So you're really trying to pinpoint what are the antecedents. Are there certain situations we can teach them to handle better? Or maybe even certain people or situations to avoid or reduce those interactions. 
Here is the list of the substitute behaviors that I've talked about earlier. Some of the safe stuff to carry with them. Journaling, writing can be very powerful. Cutting out pictures, making collage, calling a friend. Basically, they're keeping their brain and their hands busy. Brushing the skin with toothbrush. All right, that's one that gives somebody a lot of sensory input. One young woman said, I carried my rollerblades in the back of my car, and basically every chance I got, I would put them on and I would skate down the street. Or even concentrating on the surroundings. I've got the urge to cut. I'm sitting here in class. Let's see how many people are wearing a necklace today. How many people have on an open-toed shoe? How many ceiling tiles are in this room? Anything that I can do to distract me from the urge to cut. Tearing paper, Play-Doh, squeezing stress balls, scratching clothes. So what can we realistically do as a support staff? So how about an awareness in service at school? What is this behavior? How frequently do kids engage in it? Um, what do we look for? What do we do? We've got to work as a team. And obviously, we want to let kids know about the dangers of sharing cutting instruments. But please know the literature is really emphasizing talk to kids individually about this. This is not something you talk to a classroom of students about because I guarantee you somebody is going to talk about how it works for them. And kids that are known to engage in self-injury, well, in the counseling or the nursing office, we might even ask them to minimize their discussion of this with their peers. All right, identifying and expressing emotions verbally, um, being patient, being supportive, all very, very important. And yes, it would be a good idea to have group counseling, but only if you're going to have counseling with kids that are at risk, and maybe we can increase those coping skills so this behavior does not start for them. But if they're engaging in the behavior already, individual treatment. What is the most promising treatment for self-injury? Well, cognitive behavior therapy has been shown to be promising. But really, the most promising treatment is what is called dialectical behavior therapy. There's a woman out of the University of Washington named Marsha Linehan. And basically, she is applying dialectical behavior therapy to help both suicidal individuals and to help those that engage in self-injury. And with suicidal individuals, I need to cover just a couple of things. The most widely accepted model of suicide, a gentleman I know by the name of Thomas Joyner, interpersonal theory. Desire for death involves two main factors, thwarted belongingness, and it also involves perceiving yourself as a burden to others. You don't have to be a burden. You just have to think you are. Okay, a lot of people have low belongingness and believe they're a burden to others. So what's the key thing in his theory? An acquired capability for suicide. They work up to it through traumatic experiences, exposure to death, through maybe extreme substance abuse that kind of dulls the senses and uh, gets people one step closer to making a suicide attempt, and self-injury is acquiring a capability. They become comfortable with injuring their body, and later on, if they are suicidal, it's almost like they've given themselves a little training to move to the step of actually making a suicide attempt. So DBT has been found to be very helpful with suicidal individuals and those engaging in self-injury. 
But how does it differ from typical talk therapy? Well, it has a couple of very distinct differences. Certainly, there are counseling sessions. But in addition, uh, there is sort of a focus on Eastern thinking, mindfulness, meditation, relaxation. Those are all part of DBT. And what's particularly unusual is that the DBT therapist needs to be available by phone. Kid has an urge to cut, but this is Tuesday. Their appointment is Thursday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. You want them to be able to reach their therapist right now and have a conversation and get through a difficult five or ten minutes. So it involves mindfulness and this relaxation yoga emphasis as well. And it usually involves social skills training often twice a week to go with the individual DBT session. And a good question that you can all be thinking about is, who does dialectical behavior therapy where we live? And this therapy really attempts to involve the parents as an ally, how, helping kids figure out what are the triggers, how can you learn to get through difficult moments, how can you learn alternate and substitute behaviors? So as you're thinking of your questions, and I'm going to turn it back to uh, Dr. Lorber in just a moment, we got to recognize this is a tremendous challenge for schools. For the most part, we're not prepared. We've got to do our homework. And I thank each and every one of you and PSI for conducting this webinar today. And I hope it's at least a start for you to utilize PSI resources and think about developing some kind of awareness training and some kind of a policy or procedure in your district. Here are websites, and let me turn it back to Dr. Lorber. Thank you, Scott. What I would like to talk about is the PSI approach in these situations and with self-injurious behaviors. PSI really promotes a proactive approach. What we would like to do with our staff members in the schools, that again can include a lot of those related service personnel, psychologists, counselors, and health teams, nurses, medical assistants, LPNs, is to approach the administration at that school in the beginning of the year to review how we are going to deal with these issues that will come up in the school year. Um, or, or may not, of course, we would hope that they wouldn't, but we really want to be prepared. One of the things that we promote is developing a team approach, as Scott had discussed, and a chain of communication of how we are going to respond when a student brings these issues to us. Um, in reviewing that, the key members of this team include the administration, the counselors, the psychologists, and the nurses. Um, Scott had referenced this, and I would like to highlight um, that obviously the counselors and psychologists are um, an obvious role in this situation, but that nurses n are not always looked at um, as a member of this team. And from our experience in the 35 plus years that we've been working in schools, nurses are often the first individuals to be approached by students in their clinics with self-injurious behaviors. At PSI, we are very aware of this and working towards training our health staff. Um, health staff are not typically trained in these areas. And so we, you know, just last week had a, a webinar for our health staff on the self-injurious behaviors and what we can do to help these students. We also promote the coordinated school health model, which really encompasses using all available resources, multidisciplinary, and not duplicating um, the same kinds of services per staff member so that each staff member has their own role in the school building when needing to address these issues. 
one area that has come up with us is merging all the ethical standards for all of these disciplines. It's interesting when we look at um, all of these standards and how they mesh and sometimes have a little bit of a gray area. The um, controversial issue that comes up frequently is the confidentiality of when a student is coming to a team member about um, cutting or self-injurious behavior. Some of that professional literature cautions against telling parents um, when that is brought to the team member because it might um, injure or uh, hurt that relationship or that trust that that student would have with that team member. Um, Scott actually uh, has been an ex expert witness in a legal case that was filed against a school and the school counselor, charging the counselor um, with the person that knew about the self-injurious behavior but did not tell the parents. And actually in that situation that Scott was involved in, the case went to court but no damages were filed against the counselor because the counselor was protecting that confidentiality of that student. Now, of course, if there is any, um, any belief or anything in terms of parents abusing their child or anything like that, of course we are mandated reporters and would need to discuss that. But like I said, that is a confidential, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, a controversial issue that should be discussed among your teams and how you want to handle those issues within your school building. The best case scenario, of course, in what PSI promotes and research suggests is to have a collaborative relationship with that teen so that you can support them in going to their parents to discuss this behavior. What, what we would like to do um, as PSI and with our staff members and all of our partner partners and relationships with our schools is make a difference in this area together. And the ways that we feel that we can do this are to help our school personnel be alert for the signs of self-injury, to work as a team, um, to obtain the support for the students that they need, and to raise awareness, provide in-services, in webinars like the one we are doing right now, one that we did last week. We do plenty of in-person trainings and in-services for schools, staff, and our own personnel and also to help schools develop procedures around how to address this sensitive issue. One thing that I know that Scott has brought up and that I feel um, can be repeated is to avoid demanding that this behavior stops with those students. Um, we need to help them engage in substitute behaviors as Scott went through a list of those behaviors and that the treatment for this absolutely takes time for us to help these students. By doing all of this, we believe at PSI that we will be working toward the fulfillment of our vision statement, that together we create the foundation that supports all students to learn, thrive, and grow. Thank you very much, Colleen. Um, I, we do have uh, just a couple minutes um, for a question or two. Um, Scott, a question has come in. And I was wondering if you would like to try to address this one. Um, what is the relationship between anorexia and self-injurious behavior, or is there any? All right, great question. And I, I did have a slide that mentioned that an eating disorder can certainly be one of the contributing factors or one of the behaviors that a young person engaging in self-injury uh, might have and some people have even hypothesized well you know like 10 years ago we were really trying to figure out anorexia and eating disorders and we were kind of struggling and I think today we have a, a better handle on that but we're kind of in that position now struggling with understanding self-injury and what can we do so uh, I'm going to definitely say yes there is a relationship and there's more and more research and I was just uh, reading some research today linking you know self-injury to ADHD self-injury is an issue for LGBTQ youth self-injury being 
linked to being the victim of bullying. So there's definitely a relationship and that needs to be explored on an individual basis with kids that we know have eating disorders. Okay. Um, another question that came in, Scott, if youth are not willing to stop the cutting behavior, would you then support a conversation about reducing any related risks from the cutting? Well, you know, I would hope that um, we could get a young person to be uh, committed to reducing the behavior. And I think that is the most common because they actually often feel somewhat ashamed about what they're doing. But certainly, if the behavior is continuing and they're not stopping it, then we need to be looking at issues that medically, this is where the nurse would be so valuable, looking at issues that have to do with cleanliness and caring for wounds, all those things. But at the same time, we politely and firmly are helping them to find other alternatives. Okay, Scott, and maybe one more um, that we have time for. Where does hair pulling play into this? All right. And, you know, Karen, I'm going to ask you to pronounce that really big word <laughs> that has to do with uh, pulling hair. Let's see, is it something like trichotillomania? There you go. I, I don't know. Trichotillomania, okay. I believe. <laughs> All right, good, thanks. Uh, Colleen was there too. Okay, <laughs> so that is a behavior that literally could happen hundreds of times in a single day where this cutting, burning, pinching, scratching, not letting wounds heal, they're more episodic. Maybe it happened on Monday, Tuesday's a good day. It happens again on Wednesday after an argument with someone. So, you know, the hair pulling is really a chronic behavior and extremely repetitive. And it, it does involve, you know, very specialized treatment. I know one very thriving therapist in Houston, that's all she does. She's like an expert at it. And I would like to just take one moment and highlight the video um, for the state of Florida is available on the university website here. And then I think it uh, would probably be a good idea for PSI to also put a link to that website because what I think the audience will find really interesting, what did these girls say? They struggled with this behavior for years. What helped them? What didn't help them? Uh, what kind of reactions? Um, did they get from their parents? And I do know one time I put up a slide that said what parents are not supposed to do, and both girls chimed in, yep, my parents did all the things not to do, which really all the adults have to avoid getting in a power struggle. How can we help you? Let's get to the bottom of what's causing this. There is hope, but we can't get in any kind of an intense struggle with them. That's not going to help. And then, of course, we do have the um, contact information for Karen and Colleen and myself. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Yes, I did want to allude to that contact information. We're out of time, but uh, certainly Colleen and or Scott are open to receiving emails. If you have further questions, I put my own uh, email address there. We're always open to uh, receiving ideas about future webinars. Please feel free to share with me any of your suggestions there. I do want you to know that we are posting um, the slides from this presentation along with the link to the um, video that Scott alluded to on our website. Um, shortly after the webinar um, concludes, you will be receiving that survey I told you about. Uh, you must fill that out if you're um, going to expect to get a certificate of attendance. And please give us at least a week to get those certificates out. But um, complete the survey 
and uh, submit that, and then you will be receiving uh, the certificate in a timely fashion. So once again, um, thank you so much for attending, and don't hesitate to reach out to us. We really appreciate um, your participation today. Thank you.